for that. Well, we come back to our text in Daniel chapter 10 tonight. Daniel chapter 10 and verses 1 to 21 is our section. And last week we started into this final prophecy of Daniel that encompasses the last three chapters of this book. This prophecy takes up chapters 10, 11, and 12. It's all one prophecy that concludes this great book of Daniel with this amazing proclamation and this prophecy given to Daniel. Our first point last week was a fast time in which we saw Daniel's time of fasting. You see that that's there in your prayer guide. Uh, second to the back page on the right there is some notes that have our title and our theme and our, uh, our outline, our points for the message. And we saw that fast time and, and it was the first point and we saw many aspects in this first point of chapter 9 restated which we would expect because we know that this is a continuous flow of prophecy. Chapter 7 was the overview, and now 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 are further establishment of the facts that were brought forward in chapter 7. So we saw many of those same details. We saw the time of the prophecy from, chapter, from verse 1 of chapter 10. And we saw that the message was true. And that was the repeated frame of the refrain of the Bible to its own authority, to its own authenticity, and to its own authorial confirmation. God's word tells us from beginning to end that it is true, that it is the word of God, that it is without error, and that it is completely harmonious. Now, there is no way that 40 of us could sit down and try to write a consistent account of one theme without error and conflict. And yet, for over 1,500 years, in 66 books, by 40 authors, God has given us a perfect, inerrant, inspired word that has no conflict, no error, and that is accurate, not only down to the sentence and to the word, but even to the accents to every jot and tittle, as Scripture tells us. Not only did we see that accuracy, we, thought, we saw that it was a message of great conflict. Keep that in mind tonight, because we're going to see another aspect of something great that we see nowhere else in the Bible in our discussion this evening. But this was a message of great conflict, and that was connecting the attacks against the Jewish exiles that have gone back to Jerusalem and they had laid the temple of the, the foundation of the temple. It is just before Passover, as we know from the context of our discussion, which occurred on 14 Nisan. And now the Passover, which could have for the first time in 70 years been celebrated in Jerusalem with the temple now under construction, with the altar reconstructed, is shut down. And that is a time of great conflict. Conflict from those that are around the violence against the Jews there in Jerusalem. But also, Daniel also recognized what was going on. And verse 1 tells us, because he had understanding. Although not complete, as we discussed from Daniel 12.8, he did have understanding. And his understanding... And his major three-week fast was because he knew that the ultimate enemy of God is that which was, or is he who was behind the attack against his people, i.e. Satan. And this is later confirmed in our text in verse 13 of chapter 10 of Daniel. So this took us to our second point, a fascinating time. A fascinating time. And so let's return to our title tonight, Confounding Considerations, Confounding Considerations, and our theme, Three Astounding Times That Correlate to Your Life. Each of our three points with a specific reference to an aspect of time, and each of these three astounding aspects of time that correlate directly to your life. 
And this, as we come to our second point, a fascinating time. Let's read again the section of Scripture that encompasses our second point, and that is verses 4 through 9 of Daniel chapter 10. Follow along, if you would, in your Bibles. Daniel 10 and 4. On the 24th day of the first month, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Uphaz. His body also was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and his feet like the gleam of polished bronze. And the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. While the men who were with me did not see the vision, nevertheless, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Last week as we began this point and we looked at verse 4, we looked at both the time and the location of the events that were going on. And you can go back and listen to and refresh yourselves on those details and so also with any of the messages in this incredible book. And in addition to that then in verse 5, it takes us to one of our main points of the chapter, namely, who is the man in linen? And this is not a simple answer. And so again, as it was when we dove into the 70-week prophecy, this is a little bit academic. So you've had a nice dinner, and it's later on in the evening, but I need you to tune up your spiritual antennas because there's a lot of concepts here that I want to make sure that you understand. And in seeking this answer, one must look at all of the rest of the book of Daniel, as well as at many parallel aspects of the Pentateuch, of Isaiah, of Jeremiah, of Revelation, and of several New Testament passages. And should God grant us time, we will continue to do that as we move through these verses. Now, I've reviewed commentators from Tanner to Walverd to Wood to Thomas to Campbell to Culver to Whitcomb to Roscup to Feinberg. And I am so thankful for these godly men who have poured their hearts into this book to really discern and really dissect and to do a, a great job of illuminating for us the grammar of this text so that we could have an accurate understanding. And when you look at Dr. MacArthur's study Bible, and, and I want to strongly commend that resource to you, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not selling study Bibles. I'm not trying to promote Dr. MacArthur. The last thing he needs is me to do either of those. But it is simply an excellent resource. Uh, if it is the first place that preachers like uh, Steve Lawson and others turn when they begin preparing messages, it's a great place for us to turn as well. Available in you know, uh, every version, available in Spanish and a number of other languages. So I want to encourage you in that. But when you look at Dr. MacArthur's commentary on one of the arguably most challenging concepts in the book of Daniel, and you see he has four little lines on it, <laughs> you realize it's a pretty challenging discussion. <laughs> and he kind of bounces over the highlights so as not to get in trouble and gives us a few details, but doesn't come to a particular stance on what the answer is to this question. It seems to me like whenever I find a commentator that I fall in love with and I start looking at his material and I get to that one question I really want to know, I've studied it, I've never really dove into it, and it just, like, what does this mean? And then they don't say anything about it. And you just go, oh, great. 
But in looking at all of these men, I have found some great information that I want to share with you. So back to our question, who is this man? The three main options as to who this man is are Michael, the archangel, the angel Gabriel, and a pre-incarnate visage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you might think that that's a fairly easy discussion, but you'll see that it's not. So I'm going to give you the answer that I believe has the strongest support, but we'll continue to answer this question as we go through the rest of these three chapters because it keeps coming up. And there's no way for us to cover all those pieces at this time. So as we go through the rest of the book, we'll see more connectivity to this. And we'll see it even in our third point in verses 10 to 21. And in verse 1 of chapter 11 and in chapter 12. So that's just a little preview of coming attractions of all of the rest of the answer to this question, who is the man in linen? And additionally, I don't just want to present an argument for this view. So I'm also going to share with you some of the points of the other options. This is, a, this is an important passage of Scripture for you to be able to understand and to interpret on your own. Th this, is, this is what good Bereans do, and this is why you're here. So that you can learn some of these aspects. This isn't simply spoon feeding. This is a place where you can dig in deep. You can get your fingers in the dirt. Come up with your nails full of mud. And know what's being talked about here. So that you can answer the questions. That's what I want for you. Not just that you go, oh, Pastor Scott says that. And this commentator, he said that. Said that. I want you to know. I want you to be able to recognize these details as you look into the word and learn and know and have confidence in how to interpret it for yourselves. So with no further ado, the man in verses 5 to 9 is the pre-incarnate Christ. And here's why this section confirms it. And then keep in mind the other options, we will address them. The linen garment, first off, in verse 5, is indicative of the office of priesthood. The same word is used in Exodus 28, 42, and 1 Samuel 2, 18. By the way, we'll go through a lot of different scripture references, particularly in the next uh, few weeks as we go through these verses throughout chapter 12. You might want to just write those down and you can study them on your own. I won't go through all of them because there's just too many. So these are good places for you to start in your own study. So that was Exodus 28, 42, and 1 Samuel 2, 18. One other little hint, when you're writing down scripture verses, when uh, Jim is preaching or when I'm preaching or teaching or Scott or anyone else, use the shortened abbreviations. Use the three-letter abbreviations for the book. Even if you don't know exactly what they are, they come up pretty quickly. So Exodus, well, four-letter E-X-O-D uh, for Samuel, S-A-M, and that'll make it much quicker. You can just jot down those numbers and boom, so you don't get behind and feel like, oh, I can't catch up and I quit taking notes. So Exodus 28, 42 and 1 Samuel 2, 18 talk about this word and use this Hebrew word linen. And in the Old Testament, this word is used exclusively to describe those associated with the priesthood. Think about that for a minute. If this is Gabriel, if this is Michael, how can an angel have a role in the priesthood? Don't leave that yet, just keep that spinning for a minute. Additionally, we'll see the same Hebrew word for linen describing the pre-incarnate Christ in Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 2. This one I am going to go to because this is a very important passage. Ezekiel chapter 9 and 10 focus on this topic, but Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 2 bring this issue to light for us and talk about this same consideration. I'm going to begin at verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 9. This is the vision of the slaughter that Ezekiel is proclaiming in his prophecy to the remnant that is by the river Kibar. 
Verse 9 and 1, then he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, draw near, O executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. Behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate which faces north, each with his shattering weapon in his hand. And among them was a certain man, note the phraseology, a certain man clothed in linen with a writing case at his loins. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Were we to continue to go through and look at Ezekiel's 9 and 10, we would recognize that this is a picture of the pre-incarnate Christ coming as the judge of the wicked, of those who would be marked out for that condemnation. Exactly what the aspects that we see in several places in Scripture. So the parallels to the book of Daniel are very clear. When we see again a certain man, we see him also in linen. So this is giving us some additional detail to this section. However, in Revelation 15.6, Revelation 15.6, we see the seven angels of the seven plagues, and they are also dressed in linen. Now, before we say, wait a minute, does that contradict everything that you said? No, it does not. There are about six different Greek words for linen. This particular word that's used in Revelation 15, 6 is not the word that is used to describe the very fine linen, which is how the priestly garments are described in the Old Testament. So this doesn't have the strong connection to that fine linen robes of the priesthood. But I want you to be aware of it because these are the discussions that come forward. Next, we see a belt of pure or refined gold. Unlike the priest's sash, which is also of linen, this would be most distinctive. So this not only is describing a priest, that he did have a belt akin to the linen sash that the priest would wear, but instead, this was a belt of gold, and not just gold, but fine gold. So this would, again, be a very unique indicator. His body, in verse 6, is described as barrel, as barrel. This is also translated as topaz or jasper or chrysolite, all indicating the gleam of a precious stone. We're not clear on exactly which stone it is, but we are clear about is that this is a very strong and powerful expression. By the way, we see this same stone in Exodus 28, 20. If that sounds familiar, it's because that is the same section that I referenced to you just a little earlier, only now Exodus 28, 20, and also Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 16, both of which are describing deity. So this is all an indication of a divine nature, of an element, of an individual who is bringing forth this, this ambiance as if he were pure, pure, uh, uh, a, a pure stone. And then we see his face like lightning, something exceedingly bright and gleaming. This is how Jesus' face is described also on the Mount of Transfiguration, isn't it? In Matthew 17, 2, where it says, His face shone like the sun. So we see parallel aspects, lightning and a brightness of the sun. And then his eyes are like flaming torches. Again, this is how Jesus is described in Revelation 2 and 18. And in Revelation 2, 18, it says, As the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire. Next, we see his arms and feet of polished bronze. In Micah 4.13, we see bronze as an indication of great strength. So Micah 4.13 also adds and confirms for us that this is a divine element and one which bears merit 
to Christ. Although we recognize that in great strength, so also would be the connotation for the archangel Michael and for Gabriel. So we want to understand those parallels. Lastly, the uproarious sound of his voice. Tanner notes the parallel of this uh, overpowering and majestic sound as the very words that brought forth creation in Genesis 1. And God said, let there be light. And who is the creator God? Yes, it is God the Father. Yes, it is God the Spirit in Genesis 1-2. And yes, it is God the Son in Colossians 1-16. So we have God the Son in His role exercising the authority of God in creation through His spoken word. And this is the same spoken word that brought everything into existence that Daniel is now hearing as this tumult, as this roaring, this massive sound. Incredible to understand that. Not only that, we see this same Reflection in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. The author of Hebrews in chapter 1 and verse 3 writes, And he is the radiance of his glory. Wish we had time to park there for a minute. That word radiance carries forth the same idea as this glowing stone, as this bright as the sun face, as these eyes of fire. And he is the radiance of his glory, that is Christ, the radiance of God's glory, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Here again is the power of creation in the very word that is being heard, which clearly is the word of God. And for, the re for these reasons and more, which we'll address in a moment, verses 5 and 6 are a picture of the pre-incarnate Christ. But what of the arguments that this is Michael? Well, Michael is mentioned two times in the next section. We see Michael mentioned in verse 13, and we see Michael mentioned in verse 21. So, in the context, we do see his name mentioned. However, it doesn't make sense that we would see Michael mentioned by name in the third person, and then left unnamed as a certain man in this powerful description. So those who claim that this is Michael have a problem in two facets. First off, the fact that in the next section that his name is in the third person. And if this is a continuation of the text, which all those that believe that this is an angelic representation would hold, then it still cannot be Michael because he is referenced in a fashion that would not be used were he the one that was being spoken about. As for those who claim this is Gabriel, we must consider several facets as Gabriel is not named in this chapter. But we do see Gabriel called a man back in chapter 9 and verse 21 of Daniel 9.21. The general understanding is that all or most of all of verses 10 to 21 are referred to a specific angel who probably is Gabriel. That is because he was the speaking angel from chapter 8 and chapter 9 of Daniel. So it would make sense that this too is Gabriel in verses 10 to 21 that is speaking. By the way, this further removes any consideration of Michael because of Gabriel's reference to him again in verses 13 and 21. However, in contrast to Gabriel is the break between chapters 9 and 10 chronologically. There is a three-year gap there so that this would be a continuation of the subject and that's what's held. By most is that in fact what we have is we have Daniel's vision coming out of chapter 9 and that this is an effect an extended pause where Daniel's vision again 
begins and Gabriel is the subject of that vision. That does not hold well chronologically. But there is this three-year gap, as we mentioned from our message last week, and that there is completely different visions in these gaps. There is a completely different vision between chapter 9 and chapter 8. They're not a continuation. So also this is a completely different vision. Now this doesn't mean that it couldn't be Gabriel, as it could be a continuation of that sequence. But again, we have to recognize that there's some great weakness in that consideration. Again, because of the time consideration. Also, against Gabriel as the one being spoken of, is the response of Daniel's great fear. If we went back to chapter 8 of Daniel in verse 17, when Gabriel first appeared to him, he is petrified. Rightly so. Understandably so. Any of us coming into a vision of a holy angel would certainly be fully petrified, as was Daniel. However, in Daniel 9.21, Gabriel again approaches Daniel Only there is no fear there. There seems to be almost an interaction and there's no representation to us that there is any sense or concern of fear on Daniel's part. Therefore, the return of an even greater fear here seems illogical. Especially as the fear is so extremely manifested in verses 7 to 9. It is much more severe than it was back in chapter 8 when Daniel first encountered Gabriel. So it doesn't make sense that he encounters Gabriel, he's afraid, he encounters him again, and it's fine, and then a third time, were this to be the description of Gabriel, that now that he is petrified by this fear. So that seems to be a great weakness in the whole discussion. Additionally, there is no description of Gabriel in the linen or of any of the glorious terms of verses 5 and 6 back in his previous two references. Something this big, something this powerful, that if this is how the presentation, if this is how the manifestation comes to Daniel of this vision, he's going to see that at prior occurrences. But there is nothing special that's indicated about Gabriel's visage or his clothing or anything else about him in the previous verses. But the incredible parallels of Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 1 give us such great insight. And I would like to ask you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. Here we have this tremendous vision of Ezekiel as he receives this picture of the heavenly glory. And it is beautiful to recognize so many facets that come through all of this. I'm going to read the whole chapter. Not going to comment on any of it till we get near the end. But pay attention to these facets. To the shining, pay attention to the different facets of gold, of, of barrel, of fire, of, uh, of flame. So, Ezekiel 1 and 1. Now, it came about in the 30th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was by the river Kibar among the exiles, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's exile... The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and there the hand of the Lord came upon him. As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually, and a bright light around it, and in its midst something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire." Within it, there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, and their feet were like a calf's hoof, and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides were human hands. As for the faces of the wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. 
As for the forms of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left. And all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. The wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being and two covering their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like, a, a, like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright as lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Now as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel. And all four of them had the same form, their appearance and workmanship being as if one wheel were within another. Whenever they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. As for their rims, they were lofty and awesome. And the rims of all four of them were full of eyes round about. Whenever the living being mo beings moved, the wheels moved with them. And whenever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction. And the wheels rose close behind them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Whenever those went, these went. And whenever those stood still, these stood still. And whenever those rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them. For the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Now, over the head of the living beings, there was something like an expanse. Like an awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward the other. Each one had two wings covering its body, and on the other side, and on the other. I also heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of abundant waters as they went. Like the voice of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army camp. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings and there came a voice from above the expanse that was over their heads. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. Now above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that which resembled a throne high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upward something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his loins and downward I saw something like fire. And there was a radiance around him. As the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, such was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. Powerful words. We could spend months here. And best to say, wow, here it is. Let's not spend months here. Let's just be amazed that this is the picture of God. Many parallels to our text, but let's go to another place. Turn to the back of your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 gives us the picture of John the Revelator as he sees the vision of the pre-incarnate Christ. And in Revelation 1, we have the revelation truly of Jesus Christ. And that revelation begins with the description of of Jesus. Look at Revelation chapter 1 beginning in verse 9. I John your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. 
Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstand, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. And I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. What a glorious revelation of Jesus Christ and how incredibly parallel to Daniel chapter 10 and verses 5 to 6. Recognize a few of these parallels from Daniel chapter 5 and Revelation 1.12. There we see that John turned. In Daniel 10.5, we see that Daniel looked up. In Daniel 5 and in Revelation 1.13, we see one called the Son of Man versus a certain man. A similar reference. And twice in these two verses, we see the reference to a robe in Revelation and the linen in Daniel. We see the reference to the belt of gold and the gold sash, which was around the one in Revelation. In Daniel, or in Revelation 16 and Daniel 6, we see the parallels of his face. In Revelation 1.14 and Daniel 10.6, we see the parallels of his eyes. In Daniel 10.6 and Revelation 15, we see the bronze of his extraments. And we see the voice that is roaring. In Daniel 8 and 9 and Revelation 17, we see the parallel response of him falling down. In Daniel 8, we hear that he alone heard or saw the vision. We know this parallel from Acts chapter 9 and verse 7 where Paul saw the vision of the pre-incarnate Christ and those around him did not see nor hear and no one else understood. As we consider these parallels, Whitcomb notes, these parallels are undeniably clear. Feinberg says views of Daniel are too exalted to be of an angel. Verses 7 to 9 show us more of Daniel's response to this heavenly vision. Turn back with me to Daniel chapter 10 as we look at the next verses in our section. Daniel 10 beginning in verse 7. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw the great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Daniel saw the vision, and the others did not, just as in Acts 9, as we spoke about. They were overcome with fear and they ran away. But Daniel remained to behold the risen Christ in verse 8. But as he did, he had no strength. His countenance or his face or his color turned into a deathly ashen gray. 
As Daniel heard the words of the pre-incarnate Christ, which unfortunately are not recorded for us, he fell onto his face in a deep sleep as if he were dead. By the way, this is exactly the same Hebrew phrase that is used in Genesis 2.21. Oh, what happened there, you might ask? This is where God placed Adam into a deep sleep and removed his rib so as to fashion the woman for him. We see the same phrase used again in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 12, where God puts Abraham into a deep sleep prior to his vision of the flaming torch going an oven going through the pieces of the animal that he had butchered. Incredible to see these parallels. What a vision. And, and we'll come back in two weeks to hear the angel's explanation of what this all is and more about this discussion on who this man truly is. Now, some may ask, why aren't the visions of Daniel and Ezekiel and of John in Revelation and even Isaiah the same. Are they not seeing the same God? Of course they are. But this is the God who is beyond description, who is beyond comprehension. So each of them is so overwhelmed in their vision that they are bringing about various pieces. Ezekiel being able to convey for us the greatest detail of the entire visage of the divine glory. But the parallels of Isaiah and of Daniel and of Ezekiel and of John are so clear that we recognize that this must be the risen Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ that is being seen in each of these. So how do these correlate to our lives? Daniel 10.8 is the only place in Scripture that a vision is called a great vision. We saw a great conflict earlier in our text. Now we have the parallel of a great vision. Imagine all of the greatness that he is beholding. How incredible was this vision that Daniel received? When we think of texts and Daniel's vision, what comes to mind to me is that which we see in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. In 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Daniel sees a vision, but beloved, we will see face to face. We will see the clarity and the glory of the risen Christ. And more than that, we will be made like him. This is incredible to understand and so much for us to be excited about. So much for us to look forward to. So much to motivate us in our faith and to motivate us in our evangelism. There are millions of people all around us that are dead and dying in their sin, and going headlong to hell, as we once were. And this is the vision of the Christ that we need to show them. This is that which brings life and hope and joy. This is the picture of Scripture that helps us understand God's perfect plan, that which was revealed in the beginning and has continued to be manifest, and will be so until His return is that which they must know. It is that which must encourage us in what we must carry forth in our daily walk. I return to that amazing quote by Del Tackett in The Truth Project as he reflected on what it was like to go before the God of heaven in prayer. And Tackett said that if we really believe that what we believe 
is really real, how would we live? Beloved, if we believe this is the king of heaven and earth who we get to come to, who has been revealed to us, how should we live? As proclaimers, as obedient children, as those recognizing the ways that we fall short each and every day and pursuing holiness and righteousness, but sharing the truth of this love. Because it does us no good, beloved, if we take these wonderful truths, if we have hear, hear wonderful gospel messages, if we are incredible teaching on Sunday, and all the living water of the Word of God is poured into us, if we don't pour it out, if we don't share it with others, we become that stagnant pond up in the mountains that just grows moss and green. We have to get that living water of Christ out. Don't become stagnant. Don't be considering that you are too young, too old, too immature, too mature to share the truth of Christ. Because it is the only message that will save this world from their full-on pursuit of hell. May God be pleased to strengthen us as we consider these words to be those who are better as I must be and I believe that you too must be in proclaiming Christ. Father, thank you. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the beauty of this picture. Father, how, how overwhelming it is to recognize these men to whom you have revealed yourself and given visions of your beauty and grandeur and majesty. And now, Lord, help us. Help us not to read and hear and talk about these things and to be, oh my, that's amazing, and walk away. But let us recognize, as James said first, that we must be those who, who do not see our natural faces in a mirror and walk away forgetting what we saw, but rather that we would be effectual doers in that word. Help us, Lord, to fulfill what Paul has commanded to Timothy and to us, that we would do the work of an evangelist. Father, we know that it is only by the name of your Son that people will be saved. Only through submitting and bowing their knee to Jesus Christ, acknowledging their sin and recognizing that each and every day that they fall short and only by your grace and only by the power of your Spirit and your Word may they turn. Lord, may that be the message that's on our hearts. May that be the message we carry forward at, these, at this season of year as we seek out the dead and dying in this world so that they might see your glory as we have tonight. And we give you thanks for all this. In the holiest name that we'll ever speak or know, that of our King and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.